This is Research Like a Pro, episode 247, RLP with DNA 9, Research Planning. Welcome to Research Like a Pro, a genealogy podcast about taking your research to the next level, hosted by Nicole Dyer and Diana Elder, accredited genealogist professional. Diana and Nicole are the mother-daughter team at FamilyLocket.com and the authors of Research Like a Pro, a genealogist guide. With Robin Worthland, they also co-authored the companion volume, Research Like a Pro with DNA. Join Diana and Nicole as they discuss how to stay organized, make progress in their research, and solve difficult cases. Let's go! Today's episode is sponsored by Newspapers.com. Break down genealogy brick walls with a subscription to the largest online newspaper archive. Hi everyone, welcome to Research Like a Pro. Hi, Nicole. How are you doing today? Hi, Mom. I'm good. What have you been reading? Well, I've started reading Volume 2 in the series by Brooks Blevins about the Ozarks, and this one is titled The Conflicted Ozarks. So I thought I would just read the little blurb from Amazon advertising it because it just gives such a good idea of what this book is about. So that blurb from Amazon says, Blevins moves on to the devastating Civil War years, where the dehumanizing personal nature of Ozark conflict was made uglier by the predations of marching armies and criminal gangs. Blending personal stories with a wide narrative scope, he examines how civilians and soldiers alike experienced the war, from brutal partisan warfare to ill-advised refugee policies to women's struggles to safeguard farms and stay alive in an atmosphere of constant danger. So I am already thoroughly enjoying this book. It is so interesting and so illuminating. You know, we think of the Civil War more in terms of what was happening up in Virginia and, you know, all sorts of different areas of the of the United States. And I really didn't know anything about what it was like in the Ozarks, which is where a couple of branches of our family were. And I especially thought of the ancestor project that I did on uh, Nancy Briscoe and found that she was right there in the heart of all this during the Civil War and her husband was off fighting for the Confederates and just reading this book I keep thinking of her as a young woman and being right in the midst of all this conflict so it's kind of a hard book but also a really fascinating book. That's what I was thinking of too was Nancy Briscoe and how she was one of those women who was safeguarding the farm at home right? Yes. And she gets married 1863, so right in the middle of the conflict. And we only know that from the pension record where she is applying for a widow's pension for her husband, Richard Frazier's service. And what happened was they were married in, I believe it was McDonald County, Missouri, now that I'm trying to remember back, the southwestern corner of Missouri, which is in the Ozarks, down close to the border of Arkansas. But the courthouse burned in, I think, 1865 as part of this war, these struggles, and so the marriage record was actually lost. So somehow they were able to get married in the middle of all of that. The contextual history really does help us to understand what our ancestors were going through, even when they didn't leave us a diary or their own personal story of that time. And maybe she just wanted to forget about it and didn't want to talk about it with their family. You know, they moved on to Texas, started a new life, put that behind them. From what I remember, she wasn't super literate. Is that correct? I mean, she could write, but not very well. I don't know. She's thinking about the letters she wrote about her husband's pension. That is a different ancestor. That was um, Isabel Weatherford. Yeah. I remember just being surprised reading that and thinking, the level of literacy most people have now is so much higher than it was in that time period and place, I think. Yeah, depending on what educational opportunities they had. And even my great-grandfather, Doc Harris, in one of his records says that his education only went to the fourth grade. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of these ancestors were needed to help on the farm. They couldn't keep going to school for whatever reason. Right. Okay. Well, thanks for sharing what you've been reading. That's always fun to hear updates on that. We recently launched our Airtable Quick Reference. And so if you wanted to have a four-page guide to using Airtable for genealogy research, you can get that on our website for $10. The Research Like a Pro webinar series for this year is going well. We really enjoyed our last webinar with 
Alice Childs, an accredited genealogist who works with us on our research team. And she shared all about finding DNA evidence to confirm a hypothesis about an ancestor born in 1806 in Saratoga County, New York, and was able to trace his mother's line back several generations and finding DNA matches to it that helped confirm the hypothesis. So that was a great one. And if you sign up for our webinar series, anytime throughout the year, you can watch the previous month's recordings, and then you can attend the future month's Zoom meetings or watch all the recordings whenever you want to. So we hope you'll join us there. And we've gotten some feedback that it's been really helpful to see the Research Like a Pro process applied to real life cases. So if that's something that intrigues you, we hope you'll join us. Just to get you thinking, if you are wondering what it's like to do a Research Like a Pro study group, um, maybe consider joining us this fall in August. We will go from August through November, meeting roughly weekly with a couple breaks. And if anyone feels like they would like to help out as a peer group leader in that study group, you would be hosting uh, weekly peer group meetings and giving a lot of feedback to the people in your group. So if you're interested in that, then please let us know or apply on our website. We just need to see like one of your reports that you've written in the past. And be sure that you're on our newsletter mailing list so that you can get our Monday weekly newsletter with new blog posts, podcast episodes, and sometimes when we have coupons or deals, you'll get notified. Well, let's get to our topic for the day, which is research planning with DNA. And this is covered in chapter nine of our book, Research Like a Pro with DNA, a genealogist guide to finding and confirming ancestors with DNA evidence. Research planning is one of my favorite parts of the research process. So to this point, we've talked about a lot of foundational things to get us ready to plan our research. We have done a good analysis of the timeline and the DNA and we've done some work with the tools. Our previous two episodes were all about looking at different kinds of tools both for clustering tools and creating genetic networks and for analyzing segments and the whole purpose of these tools is to use them in our research and we don't have to use every tool we need to choose the best tool and that's what is really great about research planning. So with our research plan with the DNA project, we're looking for documentary sources, but then we're also going to think of some DNA tools that we can use. Something to think about is each DNA project is unique and will have a different objective, but there are these same guiding principles that we use for creating any effective research plan. This might seem like a burdensome extra step when you want to just get going, but actually the difference between an expert and a novice or just beginning researchers is how well we do that problem analysis and planning. When an expert solves a problem, it's because they've come up with superior solutions that take minimal effort. And the reason they know how to do that is because they have spent a long time understanding the problem and recognizing patterns. And then they can develop new theories and see a place to go. On the other hand, like we have all done at the beginning, we look really quickly and then we just jump in and start searching. And that often doesn't give us a very efficient way to do the research. And we may spend a lot more time working on the problem. So research planning will help you become more like a problem solving expert. And especially as we work with DNA, we need to make sure we are choosing the best tools, the best methodologies to get to the place where we have made some progress. Remember that the goal of our research is to achieve genealogical proof. And that really does require careful planning to make sure we're using the best sources and the best kind of information. We want to ensure we're doing reasonably exhaustive research and that we're doing an analysis of enough DNA, of enough test takers coming down through those independent lines from an ancestor. We've talked a lot about the importance of finding good coverage and our research planning can help us see what we need to do and give us a specific list of things to achieve those types of genealogical proof. So 
Planning for genealogical proof from the very beginning of our DNA research projects helps us gather enough data to prove our conclusions. Right. That's a great goal to set. You know, we want to eventually be able to prove this and that includes writing a conclusion. So we need to be planning for that. But are we going to achieve genealogical proof in our first phase of research? Usually not. And most DNA projects especially require research in multiple phases. They just are a little more work. So it's important to sometimes think about this at the start of a project so that you don't get overwhelmed. So when you're working on a client project, we usually have limitations on the time spent, but sometimes a project for yourself, you don't set a limitation. And sometimes that can be more helpful if you would do that, because then you will know how much time you're going to spend, or I'll spend this month working on this phase of the research. And then you can know when you're done to be able to write a report. And writing is such an important part of research. If you're not writing as you're going along through each phase, then it's hard to build on what you've found because you kind of forget and you don't really correlate the information and come up with new hypotheses to test. So one thing you can do is look at your schedule for the next month and see what do I have like a natural deadline. Maybe you're going on a research trip, a family reunion, you're doing a house remodel, and so maybe you'd like to finish the phase of research before that. If you don't have natural deadlines, though, you can just give yourself a time limit and then see what you have at that point after 30 or 40 hours. The reason to do this is just to help you feel more productive. And when you research on and off for a month here and then take six months off and come back to it, you lose track of what you're doing and you feel unproductive. So it's nice to just set a time limit and then write a report when you're done. And then next time when you come back to the project, even if it is in six months, you'll know where you left off. So one way to break your research into phases is to set a number of hours like I said 20, 30, 40 hours, or a length of time, like two weeks. And when you finished that initial phase, you may have a hypothesis to test. And then the next phase or the next month of your life could be working on researching that hypothesis. Right. It really is nice to be able to finish a project and not feel like you're doing this on and on and on and on. And so one of the things that you want to identify is your principal research question. And with DNA, it is usually a biological research question. Is this ancestor the biological father of, you know, the next line down? Or who is the biological father of a brick wall? But we usually cannot break down a brick wall with just one face. And a great example of that is my case of Cynthia Dillard Royston. I have done several phases on determining her father and I'm getting closer and closer but I haven't solved that yet and so my overarching research question is who is the biological father of Cynthia Dillard Royston and I put in biological because I am using DNA and so sub objectives are those smaller objectives that are going to get us a little bit closer and each one has something very specific so for instance, a sub-objective that I had for the case of Cynthia was eliminating all the Dillard men in Georgia who could have been her father or researching each of them to see who I could eliminate. So that was one entire project. And then another sub-objective I have was turning to the DNA in a network graph and identifying the small cluster that led to an Elijah Dillard and I hypothesized he was her brother, so I did a whole project with the sub-objective of who was Elijah Dillard and how is he connected to Cynthia. And so that's just an example of two sub-objectives of complete projects that I did towards this overarching question of who is Cynthia's biological father. So that is just something that you need to think about with DNA especially that typically you are going to be working this with phases and these sub-objectives. That's a great example, and it kind of highlights how we have to use documentary and DNA sources together because you find a hypothesis like Elijah Dillard, and then you have to work with documentary sources to figure out who he was and see if there's any connection in documents to Cynthia Dillard. So when we choose a research question and we're planning on applying genetic evidence, it's important to start with a person you've already thoroughly researched in the documents. So that's kind of how it was with Cynthia Dillard. Right. I'd already done so much research on 
her life with Thomas Beverly Royston and as a mother and as a wife and really had gathered every single clue that I could possibly find from the records. And that's actually how I found her maiden name, Dillard, was tracing down her children. Each of her 14 children I thoroughly researched, and three of them left death certificates that named her as a Dillard. And I've never been able to find a marriage record. I'm guessing it was one of those county courthouses that burned. I'm hypothesizing perhaps Muskogee County because that seems to be a possible location for both her and Thomas. So those were previous phases that I didn't even have to work on with my DNA project because I'd already done so much work. So when I started putting DNA together, I already had that good foundation. But that's absolutely right, that we have to do the documentary and DNA together. So the first part of your research plan is a summary of known facts. And this is where you can just go back and get everything listed. I like to do it in a table because that helps me just see it very clearly. And it gives you a starting point for the research. It also guides you to the records and locations from your research subject's life, which is going to help you know where the research needs to take you next. So this is a really important step. You're starting this research plan because it's going to help prepare you for making your hypothesis. So you can do this a couple of different ways. Like I said, I often like to do this in a table, but you could also do it in a bulleted list, or sometimes it's really helpful to write it all out in a narrative. And that will give you a good idea of what you have as your starting point information. So I actually highly recommend this if maybe it's a project you haven't worked on for a while and you're trying to get everything kind of solid in your head to go ahead and write out a narrative. And I like to have this be fully cited. So I will do citations for each piece of information. And then I really know what I'm starting with. You also have DNA that you need to do a starting point with. That is a whole different topic. Yeah. So it's important at the beginning of a project to review your test takers and to show that they are related to each other in the expected amount of DNA. And this helps you set a strong foundation for the project. And so that's something you can do in the summary of known facts for DNA sources. One thing you may want to include in this section of your research plan is a simple diagram showing the descent from the common ancestor of each of your test takers or some of the really important matches that maybe you're using to help you with your hypothesis for this phase. In the beginning of a project, though, you may not have a lot of starting point DNA information. Maybe you just have one test taker and you can just discuss that one person. You may want to include a table that shows how much DNA your test takers share with each other. You could also include a summary of past DNA research from previous phases. Like if you have found a cluster of matches that are relevant to the project, you can discuss that. You might also want to include information about shared matches, ethnicity, the ethnicity of the matches, segment information. Um, Let's do an example of what you could include. Let's say you have an unknown ancestor objective, and this is the initial phase. And so maybe the research question is, who was one of the biological parents of Jamil's second great-grandfather, Moses Roberts? The known DNA facts would include, for example, first, that Jamil, his sister, and his brother share the expected amount of DNA for full siblings, and they are the base testers. Then, 12 DNA matches to the base testers descend from Moses Roberts and are shown in a diagram. A table shows that they share the expected amounts of DNA for the traced relationship. So here we have just a very beginning set of information that tells us that the test takers are related as siblings and that there's several matches descending from the research subject that are kind of helping us know that we have established that relationship to Moses Roberts and we're ready to continue finding more matches that are more distant that could be related through his siblings and his parents. I think that's something we often don't even think about, putting together our known facts of the DNA, and it's really helpful. I love it in reports when I'm reviewing them. If the researcher has said right up front, this is exactly who our base test takers are, and here's a diagram of how they descend from the research subject, and here are basic matches, 
it's just so good to get that foundation and it's really good for us as researchers to get that as well now what if you are doing a mitochondrial dna project so the known facts will be a little bit different than the known facts from an autosomal dna project and so we will again include the name of our test taker and we'll want to talk about the type of sequencing, mutations, haplogroup, names of the matches, the genetic distance of the match, and a match's most distant matrilineal ancestor. So here's an example of what that might look like. Mitochondrial full sequencing was done for Barbara at Family Tree DNA. She has 228 matches. None of the matches are a genetic distance of zero, but 98 matches are a genetic distance of one. Her haplogroup is H3B G6129A. The H branch is found mainly in Western Europe. So you can see how that just gives you a nice little succinct paragraph setting the stage for what was going on with this mitochondrial DNA. Now, as we've talked about before on the podcast, mitochondrial DNA is most effective when comparing two descendants who share a common matrilineal ancestor. And so if we had that type of a project where we have done a targeted test, then perhaps our background information could say, mitochondrial full sequencing was ordered at Family Tree DNA for Deanna, a matrilineal descendant of Barsheba Tharp. The results have not been returned yet. Barsheba Tharp's hypothesized mother is Judy Vernon. One matrilineal descendant of Judy Vernon has already refused DNA testing. Judy Vernon had several daughters who could have living matrilineal descendants. So that lets us know where we are with the DNA testing with the mitochondrial hypothesized descendant. Right, and it kind of helps you set up your research plan because clearly we need to find some new test takers from Judy Vernon. Probably be doing some descendancy research. For why DNA, we would do a similar type of paragraph where at the beginning of the research plan, we would talk about the known information from why DNA tests. This could include information about the Y-DNA test taker, which test he took, haplogroup, names of matches, genetic distant, most distant patrilineal ancestor of the matches, other tested individuals who also descend from that most distant proposed ancestor, surname project groupings, and so forth. For example, uh, Y37 test results for Robert Dyer include no matches with the surname Dyer. The closest matches are a genetic distance of two with the surnames are Young, Kennedy, and Mina. The predicted haplogroup for Robert is RM269. Robert is participating in the Dyer surname project and his results are in the ungrouped section. There are 288 total members in the Dyer surname project in 18 Y-DNA subgroups. Robert is also participating in the RL513 and subclades project and is grouped with several Nicholsons who are all estimated to be in the RM269 haplogroup. So this was written when he had only taken Y37. Later, he took the big Y700 and then later he got an exact dire match. So in the project I'm currently doing, I would write about those new developments and that would lead to a new research plan to focus on researching that exact matches patrilineal line to see if we can find how they connect. So really the purpose of writing this starting point in DNA is to help us really see what we currently know so that we can get a clear path forward of what we need to do next. Right. And I was just thinking how helpful that will be if you look back at that past project and realize what you had to work with with that project. And because DNA is evolving, we're getting more and more matches, we're uploading to new websites, it's really good to know what we had at a certain time and what we found. So great explanation of the Y DNA. Well, let's have a word from our sponsor, newspapers.com. Did your ancestor disappear from vital records? Maybe they moved or got married. Newspapers.com can help you find them and tell their stories. Or have you ever had trouble figuring out how people tie into your family tree? Newspapers are filled with birth notices, marriage announcements, and obituaries. Items like these are a great resource for determining family relationships. On newspapers.com, you can explore more than 800 million newspaper pages from across the U.S., U.K., Canada, and beyond in just seconds. Their easy-to-use search feature lets you filter your results by date, location, a specific paper, and more. When you find something interesting, the newspapers.com clipping tool makes it a snap to share it with family and friends. You can even save it directly to your ancestry tree. 
for listeners of this podcast, newspapers.com is offering a new subscriber 20% off a publisher extra subscription so you can start exploring today. Just use the code FAMILYLOCKET at checkout. Well, now let's talk about creating a working hypothesis. After we have created that list of known facts, we're going to try to come up with a theory that will help us decide which sources to examine. This is an important step and it's actually one of my favorites because you get to be creative and you are not just pulling this out of the air, you're basing this on all of the current work that you have done. As we are trying to develop a hypothesis, we have to remember that we may not have specific hypotheses with names of people to test, just a theoretical profile. So for instance, we may want to write something like, the mother of John was probably born 1762 to 1800 in North Carolina and married about 1812 to a dyer in Tennessee. Often people will say, I can't write a hypothesis because I don't know the answer. That's why I'm doing this project. But what we do is we try to estimate from the things that we do know when people would have been born, when people would have been married, and in a later phase of research, we may have come up with the name of a couple who we are testing, whether they could be the parents. And in that case, the hypothesis would be more specific because we would know more about them and we could have their dates and places of migration, places where the child might have been born, and circumstances that could explain the conflicts in either the information or situation. So for instance, if Sarah Taylor had a child after her husband died, there may be a guardianship record in the court showing that her brother was appointed guardian. So it's important to remember we don't have to know everything to create a working hypothesis. The hypothesis step is something that was pretty new to me as a beginning genealogist who was working on the research like a pro process. And it was definitely not that intuitive the first time I did it. But after you practice several times, it really becomes such a key element of research planning because testing a hypothesis is really how you make huge strides forward in your research. So if you don't have an actual person named in your hypothesis, you can use deduction and logic to create a rough hypothesis. So for example, you might say, who were Jacob Huffmaster's parents? He was born in 1812 in North Carolina. He stated in a pension application that he was born in Craven County, and he gave several children the middle name of Miller, which isn't discerning from his wife's side of the family. So, search for a Miller-Huffmaster marriage before 1812 in Craven County, North Carolina. So, this is just a rough hypothesis with some guesses of surnames that helps you know where to look in certain places where you have clues leading to that place. So, you don't need to know exactly what happened or even need to know full names, but an educated guess can help you get to a more concrete hypothesis. And you can do the same thing with incorporating DNA into your hypothesis using deduction and logic. And if you start with one of your DNA known facts, then you can make an inference based on those clues and the shared Cinemorgan project data. So if you're searching for the parents of your second great grandfather, you could write something like this. DNA matches who descend from my known second great grandfather are third cousins and share between zero and 234 Cinemorgans. DNA matches who descend from his unknown parents will be fourth cousins and share between 0 and 139 centimorgans. If the unknown parents had additional spouses, cousins descending from them could be half fourth cousins, sharing between 0 and 74 centimorgans. Other matches who descend from the unknown parents but are one generation closer could be third cousins once removed, sharing between 0 and 192, or one generation further, fourth cousins once removed, sharing between 0 and 126. So now, after writing this hypothesis, I know I should look for matches in the range of 0 to 192 to find the unknown parents of my second great-grandfather. Another way to create DNA hypotheses is based on a method. So you might imagine what you could discover by doing certain tasks, like analyzing a certain cluster in a network graph, or looking at an inherited segment of DNA on a chromosome that you have found to be relevant, or with 
mitochondrial DNA, maybe thinking about looking for a specific match at a genetic distance of zero. And this person has a long matrilineal line. And you think maybe researching descendants of this more distant ancestor on the matches line will help you find uh, hypotheses for the mother of your ancestor. We also have some really great theory generators that can help us to find an objective or a hypothesis to test. My Heritage DNA has a tool called the Theory of Family Relativity, and it suggests ways you could be related to DNA matches. And then Ancestry has through lines, which creates a similar suggestion. You receive a group of DNA matches who may be descended from the common ancestor. Some ancestors will have dotted lines around them, meaning they're a proposed ancestor who's not yet in your family tree. And these are all hypotheses that you could use in your research plan. So your research will then focus on either accepting or rejecting the hypothesis. And I did this with another one of my projects for Cynthia Dillard that I probably have talked about before, where a through lines hypothesis for her father was a Hobson Milner, and that kept popping up. And I decided to do a whole project to either prove or reject that hypothesis. And I was able to confirm that he definitely was not her father. But I did a whole project on that using DNA and the documentary evidence. And so that can be a great project and it gives you a very good hypothesis right there in through lines or the same thing with the theory of family relativity. So we do have to be aware of confirmation bias. Our brains naturally like to look for evidence that confirms our beliefs so, for example, you might have a hypothesis that your fourth great-grandparent, Emmanuel Powell, was the son of Hezekiah Powell. And you search your DNA match list for the surname Powell and find a DNA match who descends from Hezekiah Powell. You decide your hypothesis is right and add Hezekiah to your tree. Instead of analyzing the match with clustering, performing pedigree analysis, reviewing documentary research, and comparing additional test takers, you've allowed one piece of evidence to confirm your bias. I see this a lot with potential clients or people that we work with who have searched their match list and they find the surname and it seems to back up the fact that this is their paternal line or maternal line instead of testing that hypothesis with a lot of different analysis tools they just cling on to that and that's what we call confirmation bias and it is difficult to get around that but there are several things that we can do you can combat it by trying to disprove the hypothesis that the common ancestor between you and the match is Hezekiah Powell by just doing pedigree analysis and that might show that the matches tree is missing 50% of the possible ancestors at the fourth great grandparent level due to missing maternal grandparents. And so it could be that you are matching that person on a completely different line and not on the Powell line at all. We have to remember we have a lot of ancestors out on the fourth great grandparent level. And so there are a lot of good methodologies and tools that we use to test these hypotheses, but always be aware that you might be having confirmation bias. Such a good reminder. So now that you have a hypothesis to test, whether you found it in through lines or from clues in the documentary research, um, what sources can provide data to confirm or reject that hypothesis? This is the step in the research planning where you get to brainstorm a list of sources and methods that you might want to try to see if you can find out if that hypothesis is true or not. You might need to try a new strategy that you don't have much experience with, or you might be looking in your locality guide to look at new documentary sources that you haven't examined before. Just brainstorming a list of possible sources helps get the juices flowing and takes the pressure off deciding what will be the most efficient, and then you can decide that part later, because this step is all about listing the possibilities. Then later, you will come and prioritize the list. Right. So you first want to consider all the documentary sources and methods that you could use. And all phases of a research in a DNA project will use documentary sources. We can't do DNA without the documents. But the clues gained from DNA test results will lead us to people that need to be identified in their specific time and place. And so we return to things like the census, birth records, cemetery records. And you can incorporate previously reviewed sources that you'd like to examine again. 
Perhaps in your timeline you notice that you were just using a derivative record and so you want to go get the original will or the complete probate packet or look for more tax records around the one that you previously found. So this is a chance to dive deeper into your research subject's life. We typically think of research plans as a list of new sources to consult. However, it might be that you are reviewing sources that you already have gathered. For example, you might have found an abstract of a deed and now you want to transcribe the entire thing, or perhaps you were using a source of a family history and now you want to go verify all the source citations in that. And so a lot of times we will be using what we had previously. But then of course we are going to want to consult new sources. And so if we have created that locality guide that we've talked about previously, we should have some really great ideas of new things to tackle in our locality. And often this is the reason why we haven't found our ancestor yet because we haven't thought outside the box. We're just using you know, two or three types of records and our locality guide can point out a whole slew of other things that we should consult. For instance, if we're searching for the children of Robert Doherty, who was married in 1784 in Craven County, North Carolina, and died in 1844 in Warren County, Kentucky, you'll want to list sources that address both of those localities from the years 1784 to 1844. And we want to have specific record collections that might name his children. We're always trying to think of how we're going to answer our objective and stay focused on the objective for this phase of the research. And so some things that we could look at would be a list of marriages in Warren County, Kentucky, or we could look at deed abstracts of Warren County, Kentucky. We could look at probate of Warren County, Kentucky, and under each of those headings of land probate and marriages, we could have several different sources, whether they are published sources like a book with abstracts or a specific collection on Family Search or Ancestry or another website to go and search. And we want to be very specific in this, not just the search marriage records. Instead, we want to list Warren County, Kentucky marriage records, 1797-1897, Family Search, and then the specific URL to that record on Family Search or that collection on Family Search. So having the links, having the complete information written out is so helpful. In my locality guide, when I'm putting in a published source like a county history or a marriage book abstract, I like to create it just as I would use for my citation. And so then I have it all ready to go when I am putting it to my research log. And you can also just do links, but it's nice to be as complete as you can. So you know exactly what you're talking about. Now you might have some methodology that you want to use. It could be that you put into your list of identified sources something like do an analysis of the fan club, the friends, family, associates, and neighbors, or do a census study and discover everyone between the 1830 censuses in the county. Or maybe you're going to trace the land ownership or survey the tax records. And it could be that your project calls for a whole surname survey looking for all the people with a surname in the census or, or in the county, or maybe you're going to correlate military records and pensions. So there's a lot of different things to think about that you might want to put in for your documentary sources and methods as you're making this list. And it can be as long as you want because you will prioritize, but I often come back to my list for a subsequent phase of the research, things that I haven't gotten to yet, I will sometimes put in the next phase of research. Right, such a good point. And you can also add ideas from DNA sources and methods to your list of brainstormed ideas. And maybe you would want to review matches from a previous test taker and just look a little deeper than you had in the past or look at a different cluster. Maybe you're going to ask people to transfer to GEDmatch, planning in advance to help you to meet standard 54, which requires sufficient verifiable data. And then when we write a proof argument, we'll have some data on GEDmatch that people can go see for themselves. And this could be an important part of our plan. Maybe we just want to ask our matches to transfer to MyHeritage or Family Tree DNA to look at chromosome browsers and triangulation. Another thing in your plan, you could brainstorm the idea to add new test takers. 
especially if you're not finding enough relevant matches to answer your research question, you're going to probably need to do this. Maybe in your targeted testing plan, you'll include the idea to ask people who've already tested to share their results with you and so that you can then analyze their matches. And as we're doing this, we can consider selecting test takers who descend from unique child lines of the research subject and also consider possible xDNA inheritance paths as well as mitochondrial and Y-DNA so that we can possibly test people who would be helping us with those types of DNA. We can also try to test people who would help us rule out irrelevant lines. And we need to think about an adequate number of test takers, you know, if we're going to try to gather a significant body of evidence to help us come to a conclusion, then we probably will need some additional test takers at some point. And how do you know if you have enough test takers? Um, we can determine the coverage of an ancestor's DNA in a particular database, and that can help us know if we need to continue testing additional relatives or not. And Paul Woodbury says if the, if the test taker that you're considering testing is only going to add, you know, less than one percent of coverage to the research subject, then that's probably not needed to add them. However, sometimes that one or two extra percent can be really helpful. So we just need to weigh the options. And if somebody's already tested and they're just, it's not a, a cost to us, then it can definitely be useful to add that additional 2% of coverage. Since we wrote Research Like a Pro with DNA, Paul Woodbury and Leah Larkin and Johnny Pearl collaborated and came up with a wonderful tool to help us with estimating the coverage of a research subject. And I've used the tool and love it. So I highly recommend that you go to DNA Painter and use the coverage estimator tool. It's a lot like what are the odds as far as putting in descendants of an ancestor. Some methods that you might want to plan on doing with your research plan are ethnicity analysis, comparing multiple DNA kits, collaborating with matches and asking them to do things like share family information or transfer to additional databases, working on creating genetic networks and reviewing statistics and probabilities like the shared Cinemorgan project and what are the odds, comparing segment data and wide DNA analysis, studying the haplogroup, evaluating genetic distance, looking at mutation rates and SNP analysis, joining Y-DNA project, and then with mitochondrial DNA, analyzing mutations and heteroplasmy, joining mitochondrial DNA projects, doing advanced matching where you compare autosomal family finder tests with mitochondrial results. There's some methods that combine DNA and traditional sources, so building pedigrees for matches, verifying their pedigrees, pedigree triangulation, descendancy research to locate new test takers, pedigree evaluation of matches, and evaluating through lines. So there's so many more things here. Those were just a few ideas, and as you're brainstorming, you'll make a list of all of these, and then the next step will be to prioritize them. Well, great. Thanks for taking us through that. Perhaps you never even thought of some of those ideas to do in your DNA research. So definitely check out all the lists in the book for all of those different ideas. I know as you were talking through that, Nicole, I'm thinking, oh, I have so many different things I want to do with my ancestral DNA work. But our final step in this entire research planning is to prioritize. We have created a big list of both documentary sources and methods and DNA sources and methods and we can't do all of them. We want to be efficient and this goes back to my beginning statement about the difference between an expert and a novice. So as a novice you might just start with something that sounds fun to you and just start clicking away but taking a few minutes to really prioritize can help you become an expert at this. So one of the things that you want to think about is how efficient a task will be. We want to generally search things that are more available and easier to use. And so instead of browsing an unindexed set of deeds, I would perhaps prioritize using a book of deed abstracts that has an index in it. And, you know, we can really think through the types of things that we would want to do. And we also wouldn't want to jump straight to more time consuming and expensive options, such as having someone do the big Y700, which is several hundred dollars, before just having them test at the Y37 level, which is much less expensive. 
So we have to think of some priorities as we're working with both our documents and our DNA. The DNA bell curve that we've talked about and that you can find on our website or in chapter eight, it will really help you to determine what tools and strategies that you could use next. And so on the left side are the easier tools, starting with ethnicity, and then we have cluster work, dividing our matches into clusters, and then working on pedigree triangulation, all on the left, and that's, that's where we start. But if we have exhausted that, then perhaps our research planning will be that we need to start doing some chromosome mapping and working with segments, which is on the right part of the bell curve. And that can help us to decide what to prioritize. Now, we don't want to have a really long list of possible sources and methods because you might find a great clue or even the answer in your first two or three sources that you check, or perhaps you get some information that leads you down a completely different path. And if you had planned 10 sources to search, now all that time spent in planning, you know, prioritizing that perfect list of 10 sources was really unnecessary. So you may want to separate your prioritized research strategy into two sections, and I do this. I have one section for documentary sources and one for DNA sources and methods. One of the things that you can do is get those all written out and then really think through those before you start your research. So here's just an example for the objective of finding the parents of Barsheba Tharp, who was born 1813 to 1818. First one would be to look for a death record for Barsheba in Conejos County, Colorado. Second would be to search Tennessee early tax lists. Third would be to search marriages on family search for Hawkins County, Tennessee. Fourth would be the 1850 census for Lewis Tharp, find his children's names. And fifth would be Washington County, Arkansas probate records. So you'll notice that was a lot of different locations because you know, that's what our research does. It takes us to lots of different places. But that's a very specific list. And if we find in the very first search, if we actually find a death record for her, perhaps that gives us some information that sends us off on a little bit different path. So five is a good number. Now for DNA methods, I usually just try to do at the most three. Now, I love that in this prioritized list, there's also some details besides the actual link to the record, giving some ideas. So, for instance, that Washington County, Arkansas probate also says, look for the probate for Lewis Tharp. It's probably not extant. Washington County has record loss from a courthouse fire. So sometimes we put on there a source that we know may not have the record. But how are we going to know for sure unless we check it? And so we put it in our list, we check it, we put it in our research log, nope. And then that search is done and we move on, which is such a great thing of the research process. We don't keep wondering. And then for DNA methods, we can do a network graph analysis using the Gephi network graph or whatever you're using for network graphs to identify some common ancestors for clusters surrounding cluster 12 to see if any of them are Tharp clusters. And this type of analysis is time consuming, and that's why we recommend not doing a lot of different DNA methods. And then a second method would be pedigree triangulation, finding the most recent common ancestor of matches in relevant clusters through researching the published family trees to extend the matches small trees. And this would be for matches who share over 50 centimorgans, build their tree in the dire ancestry tree as a floating branch. So I like that further explanation, how to prioritize a bit there. What happens to the list of identified sources and methods if you're only prioritizing a few? Well, as I said earlier, if your prioritized searches don't pan out, then you return to those. And often I will do my first five documentary sources really fast, and I do return and add two or three more because I have more time left in the project. So it's just a roadmap, and we realize that sometimes it takes us on a little bit of a winding road. In genetic genealogy, new tools and methods are being developed all the time. The more we try these tools and understand how they might apply to our research, the better we can use them to our advantage. Our research plans will help us advance only when we can think of new methods beyond what we've always done in the past. So we need to consider how we could use a new tool. But we also should remember that tools are a means to an end. And the goal is to use the tool to help us solve our family history question. And we don't need to use the tool just for the sake of using the tool. 
And we should always try to use tools that help us achieve our goals and not feel obligated to use a tool that doesn't fit with our case. The same could be said for documentary research. We need to prioritize the use of sources that are going to be helpful for us and not feel obligated to search every possible source. When we can't find the answer to our research question, those other sources might become necessary to search. So that's why it's important to prioritize Okay, it's time for you to make your own research plan. Use our research project document template to set up your own summary of known facts in documentary and DNA sources. Then create a working hypothesis, a list of sources and methods, and a prioritized strategy. Consider whether targeted testing should be used, and then choose sources and methods that will for sure help you answer your research question. Good luck, and we will talk to you again next week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening. We hope that something you heard today will help you make progress in your research. If you want to learn more, purchase our books, Research Like a Pro and Research Like a Pro with DNA on amazon.com and other booksellers. You can also register for our online courses or study groups of the same names. Learn more at familylocket.com services. To share your progress and ask questions, join our private Facebook group by sending us your book receipt or joining our courses. To get updates in your email inbox each Monday, subscribe to our newsletter at familylocket.com newsletter. Please subscribe, rate, and review our podcast. We read each review and are so thankful for them. We hope you'll start now to research like a pro.